Our message this morning, we're continuing the, the, uh, our series of the Gospel of Matthew, and the message this morning is, The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Are few. Um, Sandy and I uh, spent a couple days out in uh, the Sugar Creek area this week, and uh, you know, you see these farms and and just a, such a wonderful thing, you know, the, these people plant these plants and they grow and they feed us. And so imagine that you have a farm, that you're growing tomatoes and you're standing at the edge of your, your property and you look out at the, the, your field of tomatoes and you can't see the end because it goes on for a couple miles. Tomato after tomato plant after tomato plant filled with tomatoes. And the tomatoes need picked. They're ripe. They need picked. And you know that if you don't pick them soon, they're going to rot. The plants are going to die. The tomatoes are going to rot. The problem is, though, that there's only you and a couple of others to pick all those tomatoes by hand. Will the plants die? Will the tomatoes rot before you get to them? Time is of the essence. And you don't want to lose one tomato, let alone a lot. Now let's say that there are many people who could help you, but they're just too busy doing their own thing. They say they love you. They say that they really support your tomato farming. But they just don't do what's necessary to show up and to help you. Now, it's one thing to put yourself ahead of a friend. It's another thing to put yourself ahead of God. You know, on Wednesday we studied Haggai. We read that God was not happy with the remnant that came back from Babylon because they were supposed to build the temple and instead they were too busy building their own homes. Yeah, they started on the foundation, but then they left it there for years. And God was not happy. Why? because they were putting themselves before God. They were being selfish. That's why I put this in your bulletin. God wants us to put Him first always. He wants our lives to revolve around Him. And that's not only for His glory, but for our well-being. Because don't you know, when we are focused completely on Him, we do way better than when we are focused on ourselves and our lives. A big part of serving the Lord is serving others, taking care of others, taking care of each other. We need to view that as being our responsibility because it is. But then when we view it as our responsibility, we realize we need help. So let's read that about that today in our scripture, okay? Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Okay. Matthew chapter 9. Okay, everyone there? We're going to begin by God's grace with verse 18. While he spake these things unto them, Behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him. This is referring to the Lord Jesus, right? Um, uh, while he was speaking, the Lord Jesus was speaking and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years, 
came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort, for thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Now I want you to notice something here. It was her faith in the Lord. It was her faith in Him. It wasn't her faith in herself. It wasn't her faith in faith. But her faith in the Lord. She recognized who the Lord is. And understand something here. It wasn't her actions that healed her. It was her faith that healed her. Her faith in the one who could heal her. Verse 23, And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. So could you just hear the people there who were laughing at the Lord, thinking to themselves, what an idiot! She's obviously dead, and here he's saying, she's just sleeping. They laughed all right until she arose. It's no different today, is it? People still laugh at the Lord. They still mock God and his word. They certainly laugh at the Lord's workers, don't they? They laugh at believers. They mock us as we're serving him. Nothing's changed. Verse 27, And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. So once again, it was their faith in who the Lord is. God in the flesh, knowing that he could heal them. And he didn't want them to tell anyone because his hour had not yet come. You know, for him to be crucified. But they went and blabbed it anyway because I guess some things are just hard to keep to yourself. Huh? Verse 32. And as they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil, meaning someone who couldn't speak, right? And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. Now, let me be clear about something. What the Pharisees said is not the epitome of stupidity. It is the epitome of evil. The Pharisees were evil. Our Lord said that Satan was their father. This is a terrific example of evil. As a matter of fact... Look at how our Lord responded uh, in, in Mark chapter 3. Similar, you know, in a similar kind of situation. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, 
And by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him and said unto them in, unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewithsoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they say it, he hath an unclean spirit. So, uh, it, the way I see it, they were essentially accusing our Lord Jesus of being with Satan, of doing these things by the power of Satan. And that's what many people call the unpardonable sin, is when they were attributing his actions to Satan rather than to the fact that he was God. Verse 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as having sheep with no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Amen. So do you see the compassion here that the Lord had for the people and how he helped them? He has compassion for those who suffer. And look, do you call yourself a Christian? Which means what? You've taken on his name. I've taken on his name. That's why I put this in your boat. And therefore, we are representatives of Christ and had better do all we can to live our lives in a manner that represents him well. Amen? Amen. Look at Philippians 2, 4 through 5. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which also, which was also in Christ Jesus. So in other words, we need to think like Jesus thinks. We need to have the mind of Christ. Christ had compassion on people. Christ came to serve, not to be served. And that's the mind that we need to have. A mentality of service, not to be served. We need to have a continual, burning, insatiable desire down in our soul to serve God and to make an eternal difference for people. And you know, I'm continually reminded that we can't do anything apart from God enabling us, the Holy Spirit enabling us, right? Look at Zechariah 4, verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And Psalm 127.1, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. So we need to keep that in mind, don't we? We need to be mindful of this. That if the Lord's not behind it, it's not happening. 
And the only reason we're able to do anything is because God enables us, period, period. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 8 and 9. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, and ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And how about 1 Corinthians 15, 10? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. God gave us spiritual gifts. By God's grace, he enabled us to do what we do, which includes stand up and walk across a room. And so we're going to just sit down and not make use of what God gave us? See, what's bestowed upon me was not in vain. If we don't use what God gave us, he gave it to us in vain. For nothing. It's useless. How about 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty-eight? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So being steadfast, sticking with it, unmovable, that sometimes abounding. Is that what it says? Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always. And I put this in your bulletin. The Lord Jesus promised that we will be rewarded in heaven for our, our labors, even for seemingly insignificant small things. Matthew 10, 42. And whosoever shall give a drink unto one of these little ones, a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. A cup of water. Mark uh, 9, 41 says something similar. For whoever shall, shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. A cup of water in his name. What a precious, generous, wonderful Savior we have. Amen? Amen? That not only tells us what we are to do, rewards us for it. And I'm not saying that ought to be our motivation so that we get some eternal goodies. Our motivation needs to be out of love because we love the Lord. Period. But he rewards us as well. But many Christians today have the wrong idea. They think, I want to enjoy life now. I don't want to wait for rewards. I want my enjoyment now. If you have that attitude, I sure feel bad for you. You know, when I hear people say things like, life is short, I just giggle. I mean, that is really funny. We are eternal beings. Life is eternal. The difference is where you spend eternity. So this time on the earth is a blip. It's a vapor. It's nothing. But we have things to do while we're here. And please understand that all of us are called by God into full-time ministry. Every one of us here has been called by God into full-time ministry. There are no part-time Christians. I don't know if you noticed, but I placed two signs over the door, uh, the exit here. Check it out as you head home this, uh, this afternoon. It says, you are now entering the mission field. You are now entering, you leave that door, go out into the parking lot, you are now entering the mission field. And let me tell you something, it's not Aldo's mission field, it's not my mission field, it's all of our mission field. 
All of ours. And I'm telling you, there's so many people, so many groups, so many churches. We, we're going to Peru. We're going to here. We're going to there. But they wouldn't give two thoughts to knocking on somebody's door across the street. That's our mission field. Now, it's wonderful people to go out of the countries, but lead the people to Christ around your church building too. I put this in your bulletin. There's a divine call to leadership as an elder or pastor or deacon. Those are the only two. You know, that, that talks about uh, the qualifications of an elder slash pastor, you know, and a deacon. But there is no call to soul winning. You don't have, there's no, God doesn't select certain people for soul winning. I mean, I don't see any evidence of that in the Bible. Every believer is commanded to preach the gospel. Everyone. Matthew 28, 19, 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That applies to everyone, all believers, everyone. Look at Proverbs 11.30. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Is wise. I love this next one as well. 1 Corinthians 9.16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. Yeah, I didn't die on the cross. For necessity it is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. This is a necessity to do it. So the Lord is looking out at all these people and he's saying, look at this harvest. But very few to help. To show them. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. So therefore, your goal shouldn't be just to help out this ministry, but to do all that you can individually for the cause of Christ. And let me tell you, as we do this, we need to do it out of love. Love. We must never use God's word to beat people over the head with it. It's not a game of gotcha. It's not a battle of wits to see how smart, so people see how smart we are. It's not a battle of righteousness to show people how righteous we are and how, how unrighteous they are. It's about approaching people out of love and showing them that they need Christ just as much as we do. Loving them enough, absolutely. Doing it out of love, sharing the gospel out of love. You know, churches split. Christians sue each other in court. And often married couples divorce because they have the world's shallow kind of love. But we need to have God's love abound in our soul and be made evident with everything. In other words, love people because of who you are in Christ not because of who they are. You know, God loves us because of who he is, not because of who we are, because we don't deserve it. There is not a one of us that deserves it. I saw something today. Uh, some, somebody posted some, some meme or whatever you call those things um, about uh, uh, somebody said something about uh, uh, God loves you because you deserve it. <sighs> I think I'm going to have a stroke. You know? 
No, that's the point. We don't deserve it. That's why his love is so unbelievable. You know, he could have squashed us like a grape and never given us the ability to accept a free gift or sent his son at all to save us. He didn't have to do that. He did because he loves us, not because we deserve it. So I need your love. I need your prayers. I need you all to um, help me to obey God and you all need me to help you obey God and work together for Christ. And if you've been messing up, we all mess up at times. We all go off the rails at times. And it's not the devil making us do it, like Geraldine used to say. Remember Geraldine? Uh, yeah, Flip, Flip Wilson. Yeah, Flip Wilson used to play Geraldine. It said, the devil made me do it. The uh, devil uh, can't make you do anything. But if you've messed up, you know, you ask God to help you to get back up and you move on, right? It's hills and valleys, isn't it? Look, Satan and his minions will attack us and try to disrupt our service to the Lord. And even if Satan were somehow to disappear, we still have this carcass we're attached to that encourages us to sin, that cries out to be satisfied in some way. And we know that the world is constantly putting things in front of us to try to remove our, fo to move our focus away from the Lord and serving Him through the local church and on to something else, right? And it's even easier for Him to do that today because of all the media and everything. So, put this in your bulletin. First of all, do something for God by helping others and now first, if you truly want to work for the Lord, you first have to be born again. You have to be a born again Christian. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So then once you are saved, God wants you to crucify the lusts and desires of the flesh. Not as a condition to be saved, or we'd never be saved. But after we're saved, he wants us to crucify those, uh, those lusts. Why? Because otherwise we're too busy trying to satisfy them rather than serving the Lord. Not to mention the fact that these are things that God doesn't want us to do to begin with. But that's not all. Then he wants us to rise with him to live for others. And then he wants us to ascend with him by setting your affections on the things above. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If ye they then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on the things on the earth. not on the things of the earth. So with that said, there, there are some different things here I put in your bulletin. Every Christian should have a job in the church. Every one of us should have a job in this local church in relation to the care of the building and the property. Everyone should have a job in relation to the worship study, I mean worship service and the Bible study. So much needs to be done to take care of the outside and the inside of the property, to take care of meals and communion and coffee. You know, the coffee doesn't, doesn't just make itself. Helping and taking turns with junior church, I think that'd be a wonderful thing. There needs to always be someone ready in case Sandy's not feeling well. The promotion of our church, okay? So that's the first thing. Secondly, I put in your bulletin, every Christian ought to have some planned way of witnessing. And this needs to be both individually and together. So we do need to get back to knocking on doors. 
We've been away from it you know, with COVID, COVID. Forget that stuff. It's time to start doing it again. So we need to plan when we're doing it, and we need to go and do it. Third, I put in your bulletin, every Christian ought to be readily, ought to readily volunteer for special tasks in the church. Be ready, you know, so that we have a tree come down on our fence and our backstop in the rain. And we had a couple of our men out there getting soaked, cutting it up, and, you know, trying to minimize the, the danger of it all. It's not done yet, and we need, to, we need to all get together and work on that effort, right? Instead of it falling on just a couple of guys. I'm sorry? Need a generator? Need a generator? Okay, well then let's get one. Let's rent one or something. Okay? We, we ought to be willing to jump at the chance to serve the Lord. Because, as I've, I've talked about before, this isn't a social club. You know, this isn't the Elks or the Moose. And this isn't a lecture hall where you come and hear something and then, okay, that was nice, and then, yeah, you know, see you next time. This is a place where we receive our marching orders from God. Period. From God, not from me, not from Aldo, from God. And God is to come before everyone and everything. Period. I know the world doesn't want us to see it that way. The world wants to see it, I'm first, and then maybe my spouse. And then the kids are somewhere in there. And the grandkids. And my this that I do and that that I do and all that. God somewhere down here. Ask the Jews how many times they were chastised for that nonsense. And they kept making the same mistake over and over again. Right? So what we're talking about here, folks, is doing. John 15, 14. Ye are my friends if ye... What's the next word? Do whatsoever I command you. But unfortunately today, it's very popular in many churches to gather around the Word of God but not do anything. You know, they're like a bunch of carpenters who get together with hammers and just stand around and look at each other. Yeah, without fixing anything or building anything. So it's our job to work for, for the Lord. And look from what today's scripture. Look at verse 37 again. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So not only was that the case then, that is the case now. Our job is to listen to what God would have us to do and then do it. And where do we hear those marching orders? From the Bible. And look, we can come up with all sorts of excuses not to, like, but I have no energy. Well, you know, it's amazing to me what you find you can do once you just get your behind moving. You, know, you ever notice that? Uh, Sandy and I walk every morning on, on Pennsylvania, well, most mornings, on Pennsylvania Avenue, and there are a lot of times like, oh, man, I don't feel like doing this. But then once we get moving, and, you know, hey, yeah, I guess I, I, and then at the end, wow, I'm glad I did that. But I sure didn't feel like doing it. Thank God for the doers and not just the hearers. James 1, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So there's much that we've been called to do for God. And every believer in this room has been gifted with spiritual gifts. And not only that, you all have your skills. You all have your knowledge, the things you know how to do, a variety of different things. And so we can all use those things to, to help in the effort. Okay, so that's the first thing. Secondly, I put in your bulletin, get hungry and stay hungry for the things of Jesus Christ. Look at Proverbs 18, 1 through 2. Through, man, through desire of man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. So we need to be compelled 
morning, noon, and night to do more for God. We need to always have this sense that, you know, I could be doing more. I ought to be doing more. That desire is very important. And I pray to God that I never lose that, that, that I get satisfied. Well, I've done enough. I pray to God that's never my mentality. I want to stay hungry for the things of Jesus Christ. Look at Philippians 2, 20 and 21. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. So Paul was complaining about this. So let me ask you, are you hungry? Are you hungry to serve the Lord? Or do you want to just show up with a hammer and look at each other? Huh? And let me tell you, folks, the way we view eternity has a lot to do with this. Look at James 4.14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And so like we said, endless eternity is infinitely more important than this time that we spend on this earth. And when you realize that, you are much more likely to focus on eternity. You know, serving the Lord, storing up treasures in heaven. And let me tell you folks, I don't know who all here has ever led someone to Christ and seen right before your eyes people accept that free gift of salvation but you will never experience anything more beautiful than that. I can tell you that right now. You will never experience anything more beautiful than that. To see someone become a brother or sister in Christ right before your eyes. That miracle of God. Because it's not you, it's, your, it's his word. And God used you to do it. So God expects us to abide in his word. And so what are we to do with that? Fight evil. Work at winning souls. Help the poor. To serve the church. Support missionaries. Make a difference for God. But nothing happens unless somebody starts. Wouldn't you agree with that? And then you have momentum. You know, it, but it, look, it takes work. It takes effort. It takes money. A banjo player was once asked how he became so good at playing the banjo. And you know what he said? Well, let's just say I missed a lot of TV. Yeah, I missed a lot of TV. Okay, third, God equips us for his purpose. God came to Moses and told him he wanted to, him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses didn't think he was the right man for the job. So he began to make excuses. Moses said, look, Lord, you got the wrong guy. I'm just a shepherd living out here in the desert. Moses didn't think he could do what God asked him to do. Moses was focusing on his weaknesses, as most of us do, right? thinking it's just up to us. But look at this. Exodus 4, chapter 10, I mean, chapter 4, verses 10 to 15. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Many people think he might have uh, stuttered or something like that. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? And who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. 
and thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and I will teach you what ye shall do. Amen. <laughs> That's okay. He would have been good to lead them out of, <laughs> of Egypt. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come follow me. So this is a miraculous Bible truth, folks. God didn't need somebody with a trained voice or a mighty man or someone with a smooth personality. He just needed a yielded man. Oh, and what did Moses have? He had a stick in his hand. But that's all God needed. It was through that rod that he performed the miracles in Egypt before Pharaoh and in the wilderness. It was through that rod that he parted the Red Sea. Through that rod that he brought water out of the rocks to, to you know, quench their thirst. With that rod he used a, a, you know, with a, the plagues. So What's in your hand? Uh, put this in your bulletin. What talents has God given you? What resources do you have? What are your abilities? There is something that you can do for God that others here in this room cannot. Amen? And we all work together to serve the Lord. Fourth, fervently labor in prayer for the Lord's work. Colossians 4.12 Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Remember, what did the Lord say? He looked down, he saw all those people. He saw that the workers were few. What did the Lord ask his disciples to do? Pray. Pray to the Father that he'll send workers. And praying fervently is work. The Bible just told us that. It's work. It's labor. And so look, folks, you know, I don't care where you're at. What you're, if you are conscious, you can pray. You know, I, I have this, uh, this leukemia. Maybe one day, I'm, I'm praying not, but maybe one day I'll have to have chemotherapy and all that. That will put me on my behind. But as long as I'm conscious, what can I do? Pray. Pray. And then finally, support our church. Look, folks, we need to work much harder to lead people to Christ than we've been. I can tell you, I mean, I'll tell you that right now. All of us need to work much harder to lead them to Christ and to bring them into the, our church family. And I really believe that the size of our church family is a reflection in part of our efforts. But with that said, it seems to me that our church will necessarily never be large in numbers. Not that I want it to be, for several reasons. First of all, we emphasize soul winning. Many people are scared to death of that. We only use the King James Bible. Most people today are, suffer from easy readism. You know? Easy readism. I don't care, you know, if, if part of if it is based on what they found under a rock, as long as I can easily understand it. There's a reason why we use the King James Bible, because it, it comes from the right source, from the original scriptures, not something they found under a rock. Okay? So that's a, that's a I can't go there because, uh, you know, 
You know, it reminds me, you know what I used to, this room used to be divided in half. This was first grade, this was third grade. Over here I learned C tip run. You know, I kind of think, yeah, come on, we, we've grown up. Third, we have not jumped on the bandwagon of the pre-trib rapture. We teach a pre-wrath rapture. Nobody believed in this pre-trib stuff until the 1800s. Fourth, we do not believe in an altar call because it gives the impression that God is up here, not there with you all. Okay? And that, and that is just wrong. He's just as much there with you in your seat as he is up here. Fifth, we're against an invitation, you know, for, for salvation because we believe it's very important to sit down with people and share the gospel and make sure that they understand it. You know, rather than, you know, Johnny Olson, come on down, you know, Price is Right. Remember him? Next, we are not Christian Zionists, whereas many Baptist churches are. The Bible is clear. A Jew is not one outwardly. A Jew is one inwardly. Romans chapter 2, you can check it out. Also, we are not lordship salvationists. Many, if not most, of the Southern Baptist folks are lordship salvation people. In other words, they will tell you you have to turn from sin and, and uh, give your life to the Lord and all that stuff to be saved. And it's nonsense. So we're not that. Salvation is a free gift, period. Also, we are not Calvinists, as are many churches today. Many Baptist churches. Matter of fact, half of the Southern Baptist Convention is made up of Calvinist churches. And we are not. We correctly believe that salvation is available to everyone. God didn't pre-select people to be saved. And to top that all off, we obviously believe that it's okay to have guitars and drums for worship as well. And to do both hymns and contemporary songs. Our first one was both today. Absolutely. So, and we completely back up all of those positions with God's word, but it doesn't work that way. It's not like let's develop these positions and that. No, it's the other way around. God's word says this. That's why we have those positions. But you see the problem Someone comes in and believes everything that we believe until they see drums or guitars. Ah, kind of scratch that church off. Or everyone believes everything we believe except they're Christian Zionists. Okay, well, we gotta, you know, we've had that happen. You, know, you see what I'm getting at here? That's their loss. That's their loss, yeah. But, but what I'm getting at here is that our church is kind of unique. It is. We don't follow the crowd. We follow the Lord. So if that's the way it, it ends up, then that's the way it is. But I put this in your bulletin. But we will never change these beliefs to encourage more people to join us. Therefore, there will be a greater financial burden on us to keep the lights on because we have fewer members than others. That's the way it goes. I don't know what else to say, but I'm surely not going to jump on any of these other bandwagons just so that more people can come and more people give and all that. Are you with me? So we need to obey the Lord and do what he tells us to do. Okay, so let, let me end by saying this. Please refuse to make today's sermon a, okay, pastor, whatever you say, and, and then we do nothing in response. We need to get to work. And as a matter of fact, next week, um, I, we're going to um, have some different page, uh, paper for different committees. Okay, you know, this committee, that committee, what have you. And uh, then see, you know, what, what you would like to sign up for. Okay, you know, I'll help out with this, I'll help out with that, etc. So that we're all involved and, and all serving the Lord.
Okay? All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we uh, are so grateful for um, your word. Uh, thank you for uh, showing us the compassion that you have on people taking care of their needs. Uh, thank you for uh, showing us uh, what we're to do, and that is to, to pray for help. Um, thank you for showing us in your word, Lord, the, um, the calling that we all have to lead uh, people to, um, um, to salvation uh, through your Son. Um, uh, Father, thank you for showing us that we are all vital in the, in the cause uh, to, um, of our local church to serve you. Uh, Father, help us to do just that. Help us to be mindful every day um, of, of the important role that we have in serving you and, uh, and to do it, and to, to place you first every day uh, in our lives and of our lives. Um, and we trust, Lord, that as we do what you are wanting us to do, you will equip us to do it. <laughs> Um, and we love you, Lord, and help us to always do all these things out of love. We praise you, God, and the Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen.